All right, greetings, greetings, shalom. This is Ras Ayadonis Tafar. This is Yad and here, LOJ, the line of Jewish society. And we had addressed the subject matter, this particular subject matter that we had called in the previous record, um, alleged R-A-P-E, right, in the Bible, or alleged, um, oh, wow. I, no, 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 no. What was it? Alleged, okay. R-A-P-E debate. That's what it was called. Thank you. It is a violation. Thank you. Thank you. Isha Shelley reminded me, you know, a violation. That's what we started out with this particular um, still. Now, this is kind of like a redo because the previous recorder was before. It was in the week of the debate with, um, I think, Maharika um, versus Zion Lex, you know, and Shalom to the Chabarim, to the, you know, Achim. You know, to the brothers, both Maharika, he had a certain particular point of view. Not saying that we agree, but he had his point of view. And Abdiel, Abdiel Ben Levi, Abdiel Ben Levi, our brother, you know, Zion Lex. And um, they had the debate, right? But we recorded something a couple of days actually before the debate. So we was going to call the video that we was going to release before some of the technical difficulties, you know, technology sometimes work very good. And then sometimes you have, you know, um, um, a catastrophic. <laughs> now, of course, you can make out from that what you will and everything. What I made out from it is that I came to present certain basics, right? Just certain points. I said I wasn't going to release it before. I would release it like afterward. You know, I didn't want to release it before. It was on the side of the platform, you know, House of Consciousness and all of that. And I was really interested to see how that particular, you know, debate would go forward. But this is a point that's often debated. And particularly when I said allege is not to say that there is not R-A-P-E, right, or this violation. This is one of those sins to death. Scripture talk about a sin you know, and something either being a sin to death or a sin not to death. You know, there's some wrongdoing, certain crimes that have the capital punishment. We call a death penalty to it. And this is one of them. That's why we started out with real men, right? Especially the real mandem of Yisrael, Yashara, the real righteous, you know, men, or just real men, period. You know, because the righteous, when we talk about righteous, we're putting it into Hebrew context. We can apply it to other people, but they say charity first begins at home and then spreads abroad. So this is first for our people in the community, black conscious community, and also, you know, um, the Hebrews, right? And the Israelites. <laughs> I'm going to say it like that, the Hebrews and the Israelites, because that's a whole other reason it. Right, but some of them call themselves, refer to themselves as Hebrew Israelites. You know, it's a little bit of a kind of a modern kind of oxymoron. You know, but to make the point that is being made by many ones, we do support that point that's being made, and I hope ones also support the points that we seek to make right here. First of all, is that real men don't R A P E, right? Real men, you know, when I say real men, right? You know, it's different between being a male. One can be a male. Right? Like male, opposite of female, right? Male and female. But that doesn't make one a, a, a man. You know what I mean? And this is something that needs to be addressed here. So the alleged was regarding Deuteronomy 21.11. Deuteronomy 21.11. And that verse there, well, not just that verse, but that section of it right there. Give me a moment. Just want to get my bearings here. I don't want to try to you know, repeat what we have said in the other video, but that was a very important kind of a reason, you know, that we presented or was going to present some of the points that we were presenting became clearer in the presentation. So it's almost like a kind of a practice run. So hopefully we can have this a little more concise, but just as an intro, I want to start out with this as an intro right here and to lay out clearly, as clearly as possible, our POV or point of view, right? Is there R A P E in the Bible? Yes, yes, it is. It's the good and the beautiful and the bad and the, and the ugly, right? It's found in the scriptures because it's a real, you know, it's a real book. It's a real testimony for real, 
people, especially the real once lost now found, Bait Yisrael, Beta Israel. Now, let's touch on this right here. Let's touch on this right here. Where we find RAP in the Bible, right? Because some people are now straining their eyes to find it everywhere, and some think that they find it in the Kite Tse. Kite Tse, that's the Torah portion 49. If we just had that about um, previous, the previous Torah portion we had was Ki Tse, right? One of the previous Torah portion. That particular Torah portion picks up with Deuteronomy 21 and 10. All right, we're going to go there. And many have been alleging, insinu insinuating, and based on the, like the King James Version, how things are read and how they understand it, they say this right here is R-A-P-E. And from our study of this, we say, no, it's not. Therefore, we say the alleged right, R-A-P-E, you know, debate. But it's a great R-A-P-E debate. Right, but there's a key word. The key word is desire. Now I've heard, I think Sarnetta, he was talking about desire, and you know, others were saying what desire means, so forth and so on. And after I heard that discussion, I went to do a quick kind of check, and I said, "Wow, the word desire, as translated in the English, the King James Version of the Bible, in the, we're going to zoom in on the first five books of the Bible, right? The, the Torah and the first What's the first mention of desire in the Bible? But the underlying Hebrew word is not the same word. It's not the same word in every instance. So, in other words, the translator is using the word desire to fill in for a lot of different contexts in the Hebrew language, and the Yehudi more correctly, but one's referred to as the Hebrew language, that's not the same desire. And in this particular section in Deuteronomy chapter 21. Let's go here, right here. Let's just get right into it. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 11. All right? And then we're going to go through at least four to five words. I think we counted actually five, in total six words, but not including the particular, the peculiar word used right here. There are at least four to five different Hebrew words for desire. In this particular context here in Deuteronomy 21, 11, which is the gospel, we call this the gospel of Moshe, because many say, well, it's Yahweh who is commanding this and that here. But if you really read with comprehension, we find that Deuteronomy may be properly described as the, the good news or the gospel in total, right, of Moshe, the Mishneh HaTorah, Mishneh which is like the repetition, right? Or a copy of the Torah. Torah properly defined as direction instructions. So in what's called the Torah, the five volumes of Moshe, the Pentateuch, there are various Torot, Torot, that's the plural of Torah. There are various direction instructions, but the whole volume may be and has been referred to as the Torah. Some of us will say even, you know, the whole scripture, we have direction instruction, but in particular, we're zooming in on the Torah of Moshe. This is why Robeinu Yeshua HaMoshia, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaNotri, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus Christ, he mentioned, he said, but Moses wrote those things. And it was Moses, you check, because here we have Moses going over the directions, instructions about 40 or so years Right, summing up with that 40 year period of time where the previous generation that was brought out, there was a previous generation that was brought out of Mitzrayim from the Hebrew perspective of the Tawi. The Tawi is more the correct name for what people call ancient Egypt, and many like to refer to as Kemet, but from the Tawi from the two lands. Right, so he's going over the direction instructions to a new generation. So the parents were brought out with, with, the, with Moses, Moshe, and the Exodus about 40 years later. Now, this is like 40, year, 40 years before. Now, 40 years later, he's, given, he's going over the Torah again. So their parents, right, their fathers already had received these direction instructions. And now Moses is giving like the 
recounting of how they get here in the stead instead of their forefathers. Now that goes back to, you know, many of the incidences that happened, the molten calf incident, you know, the spies that brought back lies incident and the other various time where Yahweh was about to destroy them, if not for Moshe's advocacy. So Moshe, Moses is the mediator, right? Moses is the mediator. Let's just touch on a few things right here, 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 as we touch on this subject matter. So Moses is the mediator. Just to get some still, I was going to get a, another still right here. Right, another still, right? The blind receive sight, the lame walk, right? Those who have leprosy, right? Or skin disease or cleanse. I think racism is a type of spiritual leprosy, you think? The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news, right, is proclaimed to the poor, right? So just use this woman here, right, the victim of this particular crime. Now, you remember I mentioned that there are some sins, right, the sins to death. There are some sins that are, there's no ransom, right? And R-A-P-E, I'm just going to describe it like that. I don't know whether because of the censors or, you know, the, you know, YouTube, so forth and so on. You know, we hear a lot about, you know, if you say certain words, you know, either they shadow ban. They're probably already shadow banning, right? You know, sexual violations of enslaved men. Th rethinking Rufus. <laughs> You know, you can even go back to even the so-called Roman times, the times of the Romans. But we still are in the Greco-Roman times, Greco democracy, Roman Republican, you know, the red states and the blue states ain't nothing new. Right. When re when R.A.P. or when rape was legal. Right. This is a book. We just talking about this book right here. The untold history of sexual violence during slavery. Right. And yes, the so-called white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, the, the white people, right, so-called Europeans, they used and abused, right, the Bible to justify, right, their crimes. And this is where people say, should we be using the Bible? Because look, the Bible right here, you know, the, the Almighty, the Lord is, is, is condoning this. Does he condone? The word condone, simply put, means to pardon, right? In fact, he does not. But this particular incident that's pointed to right here, we have to ask ourselves, is it, right, is it R-A-P-E, right? Speaking about the, um, the, the captive, the beautiful captive, right? Is this what we have? Because it's easy from a foreign mind, right? Thinking for foreign mind, you know? Um, you know, the Bible talk about living in the image. We talk about the mark of the beast. Right, it's having their mindset. Right, means that you're gonna do the works with your hands if it's in your mind. No people talk about that is a, is a computer chip or this or that. All those things may be used by the evil doers for evil, right? But truly, that mark, right, is that state of mind, that frontal lobe. What's in that thought? You know, if you read about the frontal lobe in science and when it's damaged, you know, you get very abhorrent behaviors right and therefore we can tell that this gentile this white anglo-saxon protestant he was damaged right he was damaged and what it said that the abused become abusers i don't know who abused him you know what i mean whether it was just self-abuse you know what i mean but we can tell what he did these are incidences of r-a-p-e right and the bible does not condone any of this you know the white man lied, right? He lied about it. But now, with us who say that we are Hebrews, we are Israelites, you know, and we look at what's in the scripture, we have to discuss, is this what it is, right? Is this what's being pointed to here in the Bible? The Bible does not condone that. You know, there was a slave Bible. I just want to mention the slave Bible, the slave Bible. Look up the slave Bible. And if you can, find out what they took out. <laughs> you know, what they took out. You know, if the white man just gave so-called the enslaved Israelites, the black people who were brought over here, if this gave us the Bible, why do you have to take out so much? In fact, what he took out kind of shows, right, the hypocrisy. It kind of shows the areas of the scripture that he did not want, right, us 
to read or to know was there. So from that experience generationally, we talk about generational curse. And one of the generational curses the lost found sheep have, right? The generational curse is being in his image and thinking with his mind. So when we read the Bible, instead of really reading and studying to show ourselves approved, we are reflecting, right, that which generationally, right, has been programmed into us that we just take as as belief. Like when we talk about the original sin, right? I was looking for a verse on that, and it's just people philosophizing and making up stuff, and the ones behind that actually was what was his name? Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, right? He is the the the, the founder. Right of evangelicalism, and he was a so-called white Anglo-Saxon Protestant supremacist, or simply put, a pseudo so-called white supremacist. Right. So this that has been done to women, not just the Bible speaks about cases and points and examples of this crime. Right. But what is being spoken of in the after war or the so-called the captive, the beautiful woman. Right. That is. You know, if you see a beautiful woman, we'd like to go through this in some detail because the key is this desire. Some people think, and in English, desire is the word lust. Often when you hear the word lust, right, which is sometimes associated with desire, you hear the word lust. You ever wonder why when some words are said, it's always some things that you think of? But then when you study the word and the use of the word over time, you get to recognize, wait, the word wasn't always used that way. <laughs> it's like the whole thing about gay, right? It wasn't always used the way it's used today. So this shows that society and people are and can be programmed. This is why we are to seek the truth, you know, to know the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So let's free up right here. Right from this, um, right this accusation, right this accusation, and in this case, with Deuteronomy chapter twenty-one verse eleven, in this case, it is totally false, and I want to show you the evidence of why it is totally false. All right, so here's the verse, but the context of the verse we pick up with Deuteronomy chapter twenty-one. 11. Now, for those who observe the weekly Torah portion reading and feedings, you know that's key. This is key te tse. Ki te tse la milchama al oibeka. This is the first words here in Deuteronomy 21 and 10. When thou goest forward, ki te tse la milchama, la milchama, to the milchama, milchama, the war, right? All against upon oibeka, right? Against your enemies. And Yahuwah loheka. And he who be who be Yahweh and Jehovah thy Elohim, thy almighty power, hath delivered them into thy hands, and thou hast taken them captive. So here in verse 10 of Deuteronomy chapter 21, right, in our Torah readings and feedings, the weekly Torah portion reading and feedings in the Shemesta here, we have just touched on this again this year. And the good thing about the Torah reading and feedings, this particular yeshiva discipline of I and I, Discipleship Radio, and also others are in this discipline, right, is that as you go through it, right, um, the Torah portions, the uh, sabbatical mana, from Shabua to Shabua, from week to week, you know, throughout the season, right? You begin to see the details. A lot of times, just just running to this one verse right here, one could say, oh, how it sounds to you. You say, well, I can read. Well, you can read well. But do you understand this well? Do you understand this in the context? I know many ones will say, by saying, do you understand this in the context? This is just a way of kind of being dismissive. No, we're not dismissing it. This is why we say that real men don't rape. This is why we put on the record that rape is a capital offense. That means that there's a death penalty. I know nowadays people argue against the death penalty, but the scripture, right? And any kind of righteous, you know, system of men and people, especially in this, you know, um, semi-fallen state, this fallen state of the majority of humanity would know that there are just some crimes, right, that it's not even on us to forgive. 
we can't forgive that. Like if somebody murders somebody, it's not for you or me to say, well, that person that was murdered might be our relative. And then we just want to feel simping and sympathy and we just forgive the person. No, because that murderer stole the soul right, of someone else. And that other person, right, wherever their soul may be, right, is crying out for justice. And therefore, it will be wrong for us. The only one that can forgive a murder is the murder victim. And that means <laughs> the death penalty is just, especially for murder. Now, clearly, hear me, I'm saying for murder. Right? Because people say, well, it says thou should not kill right? in Exodus chapter 20. And then the Lord thy God says to go out and kill. Now, this is where some things are lost in translation. This is where we're about to zoom into this right here. So previous right there is just the context. Let's get in it right here. So here we're going to go to the scripture, right? Here we're just going to bring out the Hebrew sense of it, right? And then a kind of a breakdown in the bill. Ki la milchama al oi beka. When you go forward, ki la milchama. We're reading from right to left right here. La milchama al against oi beka. Modern Hebrew al oi beka. Aloy Vecha, modern Hebrew, ancient African Shemitic pointing, Al Oibeka. U una tano, u netano, untano, Yahua loheka, be yadeka, we shavita shibyo. This is the final part right here of this verse. Now, here is the part that we're up to right here, right? So the general sense of this is basically the same, except for when it says, Yahuwah thy, thy God, thy Elohim, Yahuwah Eloheka, have delivered untano, from Natan. Natan, to give, he gave untano, and he has given. He has given them biyadeka, into thy yad. The yah, thy hand, the yah de ka. Now, what's interesting about this right here? Let's put this into context here. Ki te tse. This is the part we're reading from, from right, right, from right to left, right. Ki te tse. So the 49th sabbatical study is known as Shabbat ki te tse, Parsha ki te tse. The Torah portion. When you go out, when you go out, the going out in a sense is like going forth, going out to to engage, you know, to contact in, in battle, into battle. La milchama, al oibeka. Now I've heard some Hebrews and Israelites say, probably with the overzeal, not having the knowledge, but they say this, when it says, who is that enemy? Some people say it could be anybody. It could be even Israel. No, this is not speaking about that. It's not speaking about Israel, right, fighting against Israel, right? It's speaking about anyone other than those seven nations of the Kana'an, of the Kana'anu Anu, because there was a whole um, ord or order, right, of extermination. I know these are touchy subjects and everything right here, but remember we said the scripture is a real scripture, Right? It's a real scripture speaking about real things that go on on this real earth. I know a lot of people say, well, if God is all powerful, why can't he kind of like sprinkle pixie dust over people and everybody become good? But wait, hold on. Didn't, according to the biblical narrative, didn't humanity have a choice? Some say they didn't have a choice. That's just not taking responsibility. That's not, if, if, if my mother said, don't play with the fire, right? Or my papa said, don't play with the sword. If you play with the sword, you're going to get cut. So I go ahead and play with the sword and get cut. Is that my papa or my mama's fault because they warned me not to? Right? The lesson right there is I should have listened. That's the basic lesson of the early chapters of Scripture, the Gan Ba'ed and Incident. But that's a whole related reasoning right there. The key about this right here, Ki Te Tse, right, is it didn't say Ki Ki Te Tse'u, Te Tse'u, right? It's saying when you male. So it's speaking to all called Yisrael, all of Israel as one man. Now, this is the principle in law. We call this corporate. This is what we talk about corporate law. 
What is corporate law? Corporate law means that even though there's many of us in this corporation, so to speak, as a corporation, cooperation, we are one man. This is what the Gospels speak about, the Brit Chadasha and the New Covenant based on even this Torah principle, right? So much of what we have more fully revealed in the New Covenant is based on the principles of the Brit HaYashana or the Old Testament. So here, all of Israel, as with the Aseret HaDibarim, the Ten Words, falsely, pseudonymously called the Ten Commandments, it is speaking to all of Israel as one man. So in the direct sense of the Yehudit called the Hebrew, it is speaking to when you male. So that means when this is spoken, Moshe is speaking this to all of us. For example, it, he's speaking to each of us individually as though he's just talking to one of us, but all of us collectively as one man. This is why the scripture says that we are members of the body Right, of Moshiach, right? We are members of the body, and Moshiach is the Rosh. The Rosh in the Hebrew, like Ras, is the head. He is the Rosh. So here is speaking in the corporate sense, all of Israel is being spoken to as one man, right? So it is for each of us to take this personally, individually, and in our collective corporate capacity as one man. It's like they say in the law, in corporate law, right? Many ones, like a, a corporation is as like a person. When you say that corporation is a person. So in this sense, this is being spoken to each Ben Yisraeli, right? Every, every Israelite man, right? As, because it's spoken also in the, the um, second person, right? Singular, male sense key tate say so saying that each one of us has a personal responsibility to what we hear as with the asareta de bari as with the 10 words pseudonymously falsely call the 10 commandments because basically the 10 words is one commandment right we stand on that we can prove that the 10 what's called the 10 commandments is really the 10 words and the 10 words is the mitzvah ha mitzvah ha mitzvah it's the commandment which expresses the perfect, we could say, will of Yahweh Elohim, of Yahweh Ha Elohim. What's interesting is that in the Exodus chapter 20 narrative, it was like the Israelites, when they heard Yahuwah speak those 10 words, right? They, they were afraid. They fell back. They asked for Moshe, for Moses to be their intermediary. They're mediated because they heard any more, they said they would die. This is where it says, and if a prophet, like the prophet like me, right, will rise up. And we now liken this with Yeshua HaNotri, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua HaMoshia in the new covenant sense, likened unto Moses, that prophet who is like unto Moshe. Moshe was called by the people. In Exodus, I think Exodus chapter 20, around about verse 16, 17, around there. He was called by the people to be the mediator because they were afraid when they heard the pure will of Yahuwah Eloheinu in Exodus chapter 20. They, they said, we can hear no more. Let Yahuwah Eloheinu speak. Let Elohim speak to you, Moshe, right? And then you speak to us. So what's interesting is that here in the gospel of Moshe, the Sefer Debarim, right, or the Book of the Words, known as Deuteronomy, repetition of the Law, Mishnah Torah. It is Moses who is recounting in the third person sense, because when they got it within the first person sense, with Yahuwah Eloheinu speaking directly to them, according to Exodus chapter twenty, they could hear no more, and they asked a Moshe to be their mediator. So. In the Brit Hadasha sense, the mediator of a new covenant, Yeshua Hanotri, Jesus of Nazareth. Check. So here, Ki Tetzei La Mirchama Aloi Beka. Unatanoa Yahua Loheka Beyadeka. We Shibta Shibyo. We We Shavita Slicha. Again, let me come. Ani Ani Lechosea. Repeat. Ki Tetzei La Mirchama Aloi Beka. So this is a basic, you know, good 
provisional translation. The part about delivered is give them into thine hands, right? And thou hast taken them captive. Now here, it's not speaking of, you know, men or women or it's just speaking about captives or what we can call prisoners or more correctly, prisoners of war, right? Prisoners of war. Now we're looking at this ancient testimony, right? And we need to see it within the context of its time. You know, I was reminded, you know, firstborn's mother reminded me, she said, she said, um, you know, we shouldn't look at ancient things, right, with modern eyes. That's a, that's a, that's that's interesting. That's good because actually we have to look at ancient things as best as possible in the context of its time, right? Because of course, you know, what we find in ancient writings, generally speaking, you know, like like horse and buggy. Horse and buggy was 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 a hundred over a hundred something years ago, right? Now. You can go back. We can go back to that. And, you know, humanity, no doubt, will go back to that. You know what I mean? And therefore, some of the principles that were true then can become true again. But we're just looking at this within the context of ancient times, right? So I've taken them, right? Not just speaking of women, right? Or or men, but probably women and some men. Maybe it could be old men, you know? Because now here, and this right here, this actually is a continuation, and we just found this out, you know, in not the Torah studies by the sabbatical. You know, as we study Torah portion, we're able to read and study for Shabbat for seven, for, for actually about six or so days to the Sabbath day. You know, for that those seven days, you know, a particular area of scripture according to the pattern that we even now get to know that Yeshua. How Moshiach observed when he went into the synagogue of uh, of, of Notri, right, of Nazareth, right, and he went up to read. That was the Haftarah, the prophet's reading. He opened the scroll and Yeshaya, Yeshayahu, Isaiah, Isaiah, right. So that's the context. That's where Kitetz A begins, the 49th sabbatical study, and in this Shana this year we've already passed that. Actually, you know, we're up to the 50th. As, as we record this right here. Let's go to the next verse, right? So the next verse, let's first start out with the KJV, the King James Version. Now this is, this here begins, you could say the controversial aspect of the great R-A-P-E debate. And I call this the great R-A-P-E. Before I was saying the alleged, and it's alleged for this verse here, not whether the Bible has R-A-P in it, and, you know, I'm just, I'm just spelling it out like that. It does, right? And we can show you where that crime is punishable by death. This is why we have to study the Hebrew, right? Because some things do get lost in translation. Did you know that there are at least seven, well, actually five to six, right? And we're going to go through at least six different words for desire used in the Hebrew. So if you're reading the Bible from a English, a Gentile mind, a Gentile, like a Western Gentile, just reading the, you know, version of it, you will see the word desire elsewhere. And you might think that desire in every case that you find it in the King James Version of the Bible is the same word or the same sense. And you would be um, gravely mistaken. Right. Gravely mistaken. You know, nowadays people can just pick up a King James Version of the Bible and then just make up all kind of like, you know, philosophies and ideologies and make believe that they were reading a King James Version of the Bible back then. <laughs> they were not. They understood the differences in these words. So we're going to call this right here the great R.A.P.E. debate. Right. Deuteronomy 21, 11. Desire. Put a big question mark there. Desire. Then we're going to say. What does love have to do with it? I know that that probably people say, what, what, what did you say? What love? Are you talking about R E P E? And you said love? No, I said alleged. This this verse here and this section here, it has been alleged that this is about R A P E, and we're going to prove to you that it's not based on the word desire. And I have to for full disclosure, 
you know, Isha Shaliana, Isha and her wife, she had, she was playing, um, um, there was a reasoning, you know, so now they'd be having these reasonings and others would be talking about, they've been talking about it for a couple of years now, you know, and more frequently. And I find it to be so interesting because the debate that they had, Maharika, right, Shalom, right, some say Shalom, but in proper Hebrew, Shalom, right, to Maharika and also Shalom, to Ach Shalanu, you know, Avdiel Ben Levi, Avdiel Ben Levi, you know, to Brother Zion Lex on that particular, you know, um, debate that they had, right? Um, and we basically are on the side of the reasoning, right, of Zion Lex. Why? Because he goes to the Hebrew. In fact, he even goes to the Metu Neta as well, you know what I mean? But here in this context of the Hebrew, Right, and if you haven't gone there for yourself, you might think, "Oh, this is just one's making an excuse." No, right? You're making an excuse if you think that you can so-called capture the true context based on the English. Now, of course, with the Holy Spirit, right, in the Spirit of Truth, but even the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, will caution you, right, of just making too much up based on another man's translation. Right? Or a group of men's translation. This translation may have been understood properly back in 1611, but even the way we use English today is not the way that 1611 is used. I often say this, that people are into Shakespeare. How many of you like Shakespeare, the classics? You know, I like that. I'll just admit that. Yeah, I like the, you know, Shakespeare and those classic old English, Elizabethan English, Jamesian English, you know, Shakespearean English, all of that. You know, but people who get into that, the first thing that one has to do is cause them to understand how the language was used in that time. Because if you, if you read some King James uh, Bible thing, you think you understand it the way they used English in that time? Now, ones will say, well, we got these new translations. The new translations many times make it worse. Because once again, you're depending right on somebody else to so-called fish for you, <laughs> all right, to use that as an analogy, you know what I'm saying, and they could be catching anything, you don't know where this thing come from, but you know when you go, right, if you fish, for example, and fish for yourself, you know exactly what you're catching, where you caught it, so forth and so on, all right, so some of these other translations, let's take this right here, and see us among the captives, a beautiful woman, and has a desire to her, that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Now, the next point that we had made earlier in this, like a practice reasonment on this very subject matter, is it depends on what kind of eye a person has. I'm talking about the eye that they see. We have a principle, right, Judaically, Hebraically, right? There is the Ein Hara, right? And there's the Ein Hatov. The ein, ein is I. The ein ha ra, ha the ra a. ra. Often is translated as evil, but it's that which is hurtful, that which is bad, that which is harmful, that which is unkind, that which causes sadness. As we have the ein, the I ha to, the ein ha to. That's the good eye. So we're speaking about the bad eye and the good eye. Many who read the scriptures or the Bible and, you know, seek to find, you know, a fault here or there, so forth and so on. And sometimes in the translation, they actually do find a fault, especially if we're looking at it from today's understanding of these verses. You know what I mean? They have the ein ha ra right? In other words, they see this from a evil eye. Right? Maybe because some Hebrews and some Israelites act a certain way they don't like. So therefore, you know, they say, well, it's because the Bible is evil. No, perhaps your eye is evil. You know what I mean? And perhaps you really can't see this verse in its true and original context through a translation. This is why we need to go to the Hebrew. Now, the ISV, I don't promote these other versions, but as you can see, we have like, you can see there's a couple of versions that we have right here. This is the Aleppo. You can see the Aleppo unpointed Hebrew, the BBE, right? He, the BBE translation, the Easy English translation. It says in the BBE, it says, if among the prisoners you see a beautiful woman and 
it is your desire to make her your wife. Easy English says, you may see among them a beautiful woman that you like. And if you do see one, you can make her your wife. Now, point, it's only the King James Version of the Bible. This is where, this is one of the benefits of the King James Version coming from an English perspective, is that the translation is lined up with the Hebrew as well as with the Koine Greek of the New Testament. What I mean is that these other Bibles are not even really just translations. They are um, trans interpolations. An interpolation is where you look at what this says and then you give it in your own words. This is what they do for a lot of these other Bibles. And though in some cases it might bring out a little better sense of it, it does um, violence to the text because sometimes they add in words and senses like easy English. You may see among them a beautiful woman that you like. And if you see one, you can make her your wife. Now, we're not saying that these other ways of, you know, describing what is said are not useful, cannot be useful. But some pretend that this is what the actual Hebrew, what was being said. And the King James of all the Bibles out there is really the only Bible that you can put the strong concordance words on there, even if you're not fluent or, or really you're not good at all, really in Hebrew comprehension, you can at least zoom in on some of the key words. So let's go forward right here. This is the controversial verse right here, and this is what we're going to break down. Desire, the meaning of the word that's used for desire here, as well as we like to point out that before we get to Deuteronomy 21 and 11, there's at least five to six other words in the Hebrew that's used for desire. So all desire is not the same desire. Based on the King James Version translation, all desire is not the same desire, right? So here the Hebrew, you have the HGPD, go over the Hebrew, Viraita. Ba shivya eshet yifatoar ve chashakta va ve lakakta lecha leisha. So we read it more in a kind of a more of the modern, closer to the modern Hebrew. But here we're going to just go through the Afro-Shemitic because Hebrew is an African Shemitic language. Pointing right here, we raita ba shivya. Eshet yifat toar we chashakta ba we lakachta leka le isha. Let's go through this word by word, right? Word by word, right? The first word, and here just to show ones here watching the vlog, reading from right to left, right? Hold on for a moment. Let's come. Let's get off of that right here. Reading from right to left. Now, we was having a little bit of trouble with this before, but we're going to go phrase by phrase. In Deuteronomy Devarim 21 11, there are three, um, actually, there's two phrases. Like, no, 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 three. I was correct. There's three phrases here, right? There's three phrases here. Look at the KJV. The KJV actually brings out these three phrases here. And see us among the captives a beautiful woman, comma. And has a desire to her, not unto. Un is like not. Un means not. Unclean, undone, unkind. Right? That's what we strike when we read it, if you listen carefully. And has a desire to her. Right? Because something is undone, un, un means not. Right? That's in the old English, whatever, but you know, not gonna confuse what I'm saying, not gonna confuse myself. Right? And has a desire to her that thou wouldest. Have her to thy wife. Now, note here that this is continuing from verse 10 that begins um, Parasha Ki Tetze when you go forth, speaking to an individual male, speaking to both each and every single B'nai Yisrael, especially the fighting men of Israel, right? Because the Israelites were not to be as other nations. And other peoples, even of that ancient time, were not all, not all, but many were degenerates in war, right? But no, this is speaking to the soldiers 
And even in this aftermath of war, there was to be a good eye and a honorable, the best in the results of after war. War is still war. We're not praising or whatever war. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes, right, it is necessary, right? It is necessary. Sometime is absolutely necessary. And after all, the Torah says that Yahuwah is a, a ish ha milchama, a man of war. But be that as it may, this is the first phrase. With raita, modern Hebrew, viraita, ancient pointing, with, with, and raita. And you bring up the word ra. Ra, what's ra? Ra is to see, to look at, to inspect, to perceive, to consider. We have the different senses. Scroll down right here to Strong's. We have the verb is a primitive root, basically to see, whether literally or figuratively. And there's numerous apps application. This word to see, right? From ra, the root word is ra. In the context here is we raita, we raita. And raita, we raita, raita, and the I male. So it's continuing to speak to each individual Yisraeli, each individual Ben Yisrael, individually, and all of the Bene Yisrael as one man. So this brings out the sense that this um, command, this instruction, this Torah, was to be taken personal, not just speaking to all of them, like y'all, you all, but speaking to each and every man personally and all of them together as one man. We're raita, and you see, ba shivya, ba shivya. What is shivya, right? Among the shivya, the shibya. What is shibya? Shibya is the Hebrew for captivity can be in the sense of captivity or in this context here speaking of the captives bdb brings it out brown drivers briggs definition right and here we have the word shibya shibya is a noun feminine so we bring it into context you male right all of you all as one man and each of you all in your individual indivisible dual capacity Right, with raita, right, ba shibya, right, right, ba shibya, among the what? The captives, the exile. You can see this right here from the H seventy six twenty eight from Shavi or Shabi. Shabi is captives, right? Captive, right? Now in this context here, take that off. Ba shibya is speaking among the female captives. With raita. Which means that among the captives, the general sense, you might see, right, after an engagement, after a war, you might see, one of the fighting men might see, right, a shibya, eshet, shibya, a captive, eshet, a captive woman, yifat to'ar. That's the, these are the, the, the five words, one, two, three, four, five. We raita ba shibya eshet yifat toar. Let's break it down. So we broke down the first two words, right? And you male seeing amongst the captive, female captive, right? Ba shibya eshet, a eshet, a woman. Eshet, pointing here in the Hebrew as eshet, but it could also be pointed with the alef as ashet, aset, aset, huh? Eshet yifat. Yifat means, let's bring it up right here. Yifat here means, um, okay, we, we touched on the Shibya there. Now notice next to beautiful right here. You see beautiful right there? You see, it says A, beautiful. There is the H8389 and the H3303 word. Now why is that? Because right here we have two particular words. Let's see if we can zoom in on these two words right here in the highlight there we go right there right yifat toar yifat let's go through the words here here we have toar so here the word order in the in the strongs is reversed and what's in the text toar right means shape the bdb brown drivers briggs bring out shape form outline figure appearance right 
toar, right? Outline, a figure, an appearance. And after the colon and the hyphen, that which is beautiful, right? Yafat toar, yafat from yafe, which is beautiful. Let's go to that right here because the order of the Hebrew words is yafat toar, right? An eshet, a woman, yafat, beautiful toar, of a beautiful, one can say shape, right? Of a beautiful, hear the word, yafe, yafe, BDB says fear or beautiful. Beautiful is, this is in a feminine sense, right? Um, yafat, with the ta, the tau, the T at the end. That brings out as an adjective, as a feminine adjective. Yafat, beautiful toar, of a beautiful form, a beautiful figure. What I had said even earlier, I say again that, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Isn't that what's said? And here it says, and see us, we're raita. And you, ra, ra, right? Ra. Now, it's interesting because we have ra, 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 ra is evil, but ra, ra, one is the alef, soft A sound, one is the ain. Here we have the soft A sound. Raita, raita. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So we have yafa, yafa, right? Yafa here is the verb. Right, so yafat comes from the verb yafa, which means to be bright, to be beautiful, in the sense of being handsome, being feared, to beautify, right, to be bright, that is to be beautiful, right, and after the colon and the hyphen is how you might find this word in the King James, be beautiful, to, to make oneself beautiful, make oneself fear, or even to deck, like to be deck, you know, to beautify, you know, to... To you know, like you know, woman do this, you know what I mean? And we as real men, you know, we love that, right? But here, with this sensitive verse, let's get into this desire. Why do we say it's alleged? Because people say right here, based on the next part of it, they say this is what brings out, right? This is one of the words that they focus on, right? It's the word and has a desire to her, right? And has a desire to her. So let's go over here, right here, and here we'll, well, let's, let's do this right here. This is the, right, this is the next phrase, right? This is the next phrase right here. Ve hashakta va, or we, and hashakta, hashakta, and you male, still speaking to a singular man, so it's speaking to each man individually and all as one man. We hashakta ba, hashakta. What is hashakta, right? So here, let's go to the word desire, right? Is hashak. Now I heard someone mention that actually in this particular area, right? When it says desire, desire means to love. I think I also heard Sarnetta say, oh, this is what they, they do. They be making up some, such and such and such. No, it's not really a make up something. It's, it's doing due um, diligence. And we can call this, when you have the linguistic science, many people be banging on this verse here and making up all kinds of stuff because they're doing it ignorantly. They have a zeal, you know? They have a zeal against such violation, but they're not looking, right? at the context of what is being said, right? And this word, chashakta, that's what brought out the what does love have to do with it? What do we mean by it? Well, the word chashak, what does it mean? Chashak, uh-oh, uh-oh. Chashak means to love, to be attached, to long for, or in a sense, to fill it. You can look it up, to fill it. Right? It's got a strong concordance. It's a verb, right? Strong's definition says a primitive root to cling. That is to join figuratively, right? In the sense of to love, to delight in, elliptically, or by interchange with this. Now we have hashak. So the other word is hashak. It's the, it's the kof. Here we have, well, actually, here we have hasak. Right, slichali. Right, we have chasak, chasak with the kaf. Right, the other word 
here in Deuteronomy 21.11 is chashak, chashak. So it sounds similar. Chasak might sound similar to chashak, but it's a different word. And any Hebrew or Israelite right, that spoke to Yehudi would understand and understand exactly what is being said here. So we have chashak, right, to love, and we have chasak, right? One is a kof and one is a kaf. Here, this means to withhold, to restrain, to hold back, to keep in check, to refrain. Interesting, right? That from over here, chashak, as it's used right here, with chashak ta ba, and you have a cling, and you cling, you join, you have a love, a delight, ba, baha, right? In ha, right? You have a delight in her, right? But notice, it's translated as desire, right? But actually, it's actually love. Now, let's do this right here. We're going to just take a little segue from right here to show this right here, right? With this particular word for desire. Because we find desire, right, six times, right? I think coming up to this, five or six times. We can count it. I like to count it with you, right? And it's not the same word. So let's look at this word, the word chashakta, right? You see, desire is the H2836. Let's just look up the H2836 so we can get a context, right? Because if it was translated correctly, it just says, and you have a love to her, right? You have a love to her, right? A delight, but the sense of it that's clear in the Hebrew, you know, in English, sometimes they choose one word, but that one word, Right, may also have various different contexts in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, there are up to six right basic words that have been translated in the King James Version as desire. But this word is very unique, as we'll show you right now. Let's search this. Right? Let's search this word right here. Let's search this word. Take that off. There we go. The search come up. Now there's eleven verses. Notice there are 11 verses with the H2836, which is chashak, the root chashak, right? Notice the first verse is Genesis 34 and 8. And Hamar communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longest, loves, right? Delights in, in the sense of love for your daughter. Now, some people say this is Zaya. You know, they were basically because of, of the ayn hara. Depends on what eye, what kind of eye you're looking at it. If you're looking at desire in the common, right, the very common English sense, right, as desire is used, you know, I mean, think about how desire is used in English, right? Usually it's used in a moderate to negative or sexual sense. But this word here is very different from that. Now, of course, the first incident that we get in Bereshis in Genesis is the incident that was concerning what is often referred to as the rape or the R-A-P-E of Yaakov, Jacob's um, daughter of the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel, the sons of Bnei Yaakov, the sons of Jacob's um, um, um the brothers of Dina, right? You know, the daughter of those brothers. And if you any of you know the story, what happened, they slew the whole town because they regarded their daughter, the, the, their, their sister, as being defiled, right? But in this scene right here, Hamor is speaking on behalf of his son Shechem, as the ancient custom was. You know, usually either a man would, you know, go to the brethren or his next brethren, if, you know, to reason, or sometimes men would commune on, sometimes or families would on marrying, you know, into one another, you know, like marrying the son to the daughter or the daughter to the son, right? But in this particular incident, things had been done in the reverse, the inverse. In other words, the um, Shechem had already gone in to Dina, right? And then when this news came back to the Jacob and to the, especially to the sons, you know, Jacob's sons, Jacob's sons, they view this as, yo, a violation, 
right? But the words used by um, Hamor on behalf of his son can be seen that he was saying that his son's soul, right, has a longing. Notice the word is longing. Why didn't they say, you know what I mean? And longs for her and longs for her. You see, because the context of this word is love. That's why I say, what does love have to do with it? All right? Of course, pointing to mind, the Tina Turner, Ike. Oh, that's a whole other subject matter there. Right? And uh, what does love have to do with it? Right? Because this is the great R-A-P-E debate on this particular verse in Deuteronomy 21 and 11 in this particular section. Does Yahuwah Eloheinu, he who be Hakadosh Baruch Baruch Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be he, Blessed be the name, our almighty power. Is he commanding or justifying this abominable act that real men don't do? No, because you have to recognize in warfare, even warfare today, sometimes the victims or the captives are RAPE, even on the battlefield and even before the, 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 the troops return home. But this was not to be done by... Yisrael was not to be done by the B'nai Yisrael, by the sons of Israel, and especially by the soldiers and the warriors, but not, not, not to be done. Because we have other clear areas where R-A-P-E is there, and the punishment for that is death. That's why we talk about a sin that is to death, right? So notice something. He used these words, and these words now show us an ancient context. The soul of my son Shechem, Right? Hashak, Hashak, longs for, desire, loves, clings, seeks to be joined, right, for or to your daughter. I pray you give her him, Leisha, to, to wife. So we can argue that Hamor, now what the son did was out of order, right, according to the Hebrew perception of things, right, and the Israelite perception of things, especially the sons of Israel, right, but in this presentation, right, even if it was, that's a whole other debatable matter, right, and we have a particular view, right, it probably was not, right, in that sense, but it was so clouded, right, and the proper order of things was that, at least among the Israelites, was that first we discuss this, Right? We reason on this. Not your son goes in to my daughter and then you come back and say, oh, I, I like her to be, you know, wife. Now, of course, we know about shotgun weddings, so forth and so on, some of the other areas of scripture that some people also, you know, get caught up in this great R-A-P-E debate on other areas of scripture where they say, well, that's R-A-P-E too. No, that's more like a shotgun, what's called in the olden days, a shotgun wedding. Right? In other words, you're not going to treat my daughter like that and then she just be, you know, no, you're going to have to man up now. Because if you already went into her, there might be a seed coming about, you know what I mean, to keep this family idea. That was very much emphasized. But in Hamor's case, right, he's speaking of his son loving Dina, right? And then right after he declares that, he, he beseeches and begs that Yaakov, that Jacob and the sons of Israel give their daughter, Dina, to Shechem to wife. Let's go on right here. In Exodus 27, 17. Now, this word, Hashak, also can be applied right, to the fillet. fillet it. You, what, what does it mean to fillet something? It says, all the pillars round about the court shall be filleted with silver. Right? Almost like overlaid, that sense of overlaying, filleted with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver and their sockets of brass. Almost like joined or overlaid, you know, like embedded, you know, with silver. Then it goes on in Exodus 38 and 17, speaking about the fillet. So this word could be used and was used both in the sense of one's soul or one's feeling or emotion or, quote, desire but a desire that is a love-based desire, right? A desire that's love-based. How do we know this? Well, let's go on right here. Notice the same word for filleted, right? In the first instance we have in the scripture, in the Hebrew scriptures, compared to the King James Version, Genesis 34 and 8, longing, 
right? They didn't say desire, but it said longing, right? But over here, we get Deuteronomy 7, 7 says, Yahuwah, right? Jehovah did not set his love. Uh-oh, boom. Right there, we could basically just almost like to say close shop on this right here, right? It's a wrap here. Yahuwah, he who be who he be, did not set his love. So it, here in Devarim, the fifth book, right, of HaTorah, of the Torah, right, here we have Jehovah, or the Lord, in the KJV, did not set his love. Now, why didn't they choose to translate the same word? Notice it's the same word, the H2836. Let's bring that up for once. Chashak. 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 Right? To love, to be attached to, long for, in the sense of filleting, like over the materials, the furniture, the tabernacle, like to, to embed, to overlay, right? To overlay, in that sense, to become attached to, right? So even in the Hebrew mind, right? Based on the words, that sense of this word that's commonly translated in Deuteronomy 21 11 as desire we see has a higher sense and at the groundation is based on love. Now, a question we can ask, this is after war, right? These are captives, right? So if one of the B'nai, one of the Ben Yisraeli, one of the sons of Israel, the Israelites, right, sees a woman. Remember, this, this came back from war. They, 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 they killed the, the men primarily, right, and probably others were killed in the battle and everything. It was a war, right? And now, after war, right, usually, usually what would happen is the men will go out on the battlefield and they will fight, right? And if these men, your army is defeated, that means your town or whatever you have, you know, is for the taking, Right, and this is what Moshe is, is bringing out in Deuteronomy twenty-one eleven. But here in Deuteronomy seven seven, it says Yahweh did not set his love right upon you. What? 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 Wait! Did not set his what? His love chashak chashak upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For ye, for y'all, the plural, you all, for y'all, right? For yous, for y'all were the fewest of all people. But this verse clearly is saying that Yahuwah, right? It didn't say, did not set his desire upon you nor choose you because y'all were more than any other people. But you can see clearly this word chashak is his love. Now, once again, a soldier after battle, Right after fighting the men, right of the, the the enemy men, and and getting the victory, right unatano Yahweh loheka biyadika, right he put them into our hands, right and then you see a beautiful woman, right and you have a chashak, right to her, right the sense of love. You know what's brought out here? I don't know if ones are picking up on this, but what's brought out here? Is almost like man, we, we you know we we had to fight you know your people you know but now you're gonna just be a captive you know a bond woman or something like that you know and it's almost a kind of um a, like what Yahuwah is saying of himself right he set his love it's not a lust you see in most ancient and even modern times the R A P E occurs. Even if it's in the war, like say the enemy troops are in the, the city or the town or the village and the men are trying to protect their women and children, they're getting slain by the enemy men. What usually happens? I, I hate to even say usually, but you know, the good and the beautiful and the bad and the ugly. Remember the knowledge of, you know, of good and evil. This is the knowledge of it. So we're seeing Yahuwah here using this word for good. And this also means that the word being used, notice what it says, we're raita, right? And you see, bashibya, right? Eshet yifat toar, we're chashakta ba, right? Right? We're lakachta, leka, leisha. And you would like to take her, right? For your wife. You want to make, you want to wife her. You know what I mean? Now think about the, what's the context, right? He, he, men in war would, not men, but many, 
I say degenerate armies would actually take advantage of the woman wherever. And we too sadly too often have too much testimony of this. And sometimes it's not even restricted to a particular nationality of ancient times. Just let's keep it a buck real. So for Israel now to be given this conditional meant that on the battlefield, after the battle, none of this goes on. And even if you see among the the captives and you say, man, I feel sorry for that woman, because you might you might remember that woman that you had to kill her her her, her parents or or or, or her brother, or whatever, you know, and you know her fate here. She's going to basically have no rights, you know, within the community on that level. The, the rights that you have will be like a, a bond woman, like a captive right, a prisoner of war right. You know what I'm saying? So to compare with Yahuwah setting his chashak, let's go on to Deuteronomy 10 and 15. Only Yahuwah had a delight. Now here it says a delight, right? Had a delight. What sort of a delight it is? Even we can say, use the same word from Deuteronomy 21, 11, a desire, a desire based on love, a love-based desire. As I said, what does love have to do with it? You know what I mean? To love them, right? In thy fathers, to love them and choose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Then we get here, right? Now notice in Deuteronomy, Right in Deuteronomy, we have three places where the same word is used. In the first instance, it's connected with Yahweh's love, Jehovah's love. Secondarily, it's translated as connected with a delight in thy fathers, right? To love them. Now, yes, there's another word for love, but this longing, right? This you could say delight. Or, or this kind of clinging. Remember how, how the word is brought out right here, right? To cling, to join in a figurative sense, to, to love, almost to be that woman's protection here. Now she's already, she's, you know, she lost everything already right there. And he has a, so it's conditional on how the beauty is seen in the man's eyes. And whether the man, talking about the man of Israel, the Ben Yisraeli, has a ha, has a ein hatob, a good eye, eye, right? The eye, the ein hatob, my right? tob, tawab, good for the good, or if he has an ein hara. And this conditional that we have here in Deuteronomy twenty one eleven is based on having an ein ha. Tob, a good eye. Why? Why do we say this right here? Because of the word chashak, right? And because of chashak's use is elsewhere, right? Right, right? He's a which Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, right? Here in First Kings, the next time it occurs, First Kings nine nineteen. That Solomon desired, he loved, he longed to, right, to build in Jerusalem, right. To building and here's what's interesting: the word to build and even the temple sometimes has a feminine context. So, in the same sense of the Hebrew, not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, this desire, right? This love-based desire is positive. That means that if a man saw among the captives a beautiful woman, right? Eshet Yefat Toar. Right, and he just wanted to so-called, as they would say, push up on her, have sexual intercourse, or violate her. Right, he has no right whatsoever. In fact, in fact, he could get himself hurt if, if now this is a big if right here. I, I had said this earlier, but I don't think I brought it out. Let me bring it out right here. Could this be used right here, this written Torah, right, to do exactly what? The scripture is being falsely accused of. Yes. Yes. To R-A-P. Yes. We really say that. Because we know there are times when Yisrael, Yasharala, was seeking to live upright. But then we also know, based on the Torah's testimony, that they turned their backs on Yahweh Loheinu, on his Torah, on his direct instruction, and did whatever they wanted to do opposite. 
right? So could this be used by men and people? Yes, the most, the best thing, right? Water is good, right? Water is good. We need water, but somebody can drown in water if they if they don't know how to swim or if they misuse or if they are abused. Yes. So could this be abused? Yes. I want to say that right here. But is that the intent? No. It's not, and it was not Moshe. It was not Yahuwah. It was not the intent that this be. In fact, the true context says that what men of other nations have done in war to the captives or to the victims, especially to the woman, is strictly prohibited in the context of the proper interpretation of this section of scripture, these verses here. Why do we say that? Because men, right, in war that have a desire to do that, will do that at any, at the nearest opportunity they have. So by Moshe here directing this to this new generation, think about it also, this is a new generation of Israel. So in the direction to this new generation, right, this is being pronounced and we don't find it earlier. We don't find it earlier with that old generation, with their fathers, because their fathers were commanded many things that they violated. Yah said, go to the right, they went to the left. He said, go up, they went down. And Yah said, enough of that, it's going to destroy them. And Moshe, he went to, 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 to advocate. You know, he became, you know, the pro council you know, on behalf of Yisrael to prevent the whole nation from getting destroyed because of the, 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 Uckery, I say uckery, effery, because of the sin, the lack, the forfeiture, the disobedience of the fathers, the parents. A whole nation could have gotten destroyed right at the time of the birth of that nation. Talking about Israel coming out of the Tawi, right? So the context of this right here, right, is saying you're seeing among the captives a beautiful woman. That means the captives could be, you know, whoever was not a fighting person, right? Whoever wasn't a fighting person. Like I said, most battles and wars amongst different ancient nations occurred with the men on some sort of a battlefield, right? And with those men being slaughtered or being overcome, you know what I mean? They even too might be among the captives. And you see a beautiful woman and you have a longing, a desire to her. It even brings out the sense of that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Now notice... The first example I showed you here on the Hashakta, the H2836, was with Genesis Bereshith, concerning an incident that's often called the rape of Dina, the rape of Dinah. Now, it's interesting in this here, America's North Country, what happened to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the black and the brown people, that they have this thing, look it up. It's called, I think, Dinah. Look up Dina, D I N A. H, I think it's a Wikipedia page. And it's interesting that in the times of slavery, the black woman was the so-called quintessential Dina or Dina, right? It's a very interesting article. I point to that because based on the first context, this whole verse in 2111 has much of the same context as we have here in Genesis 34 and 8. What do we mean by that? One is the word longing, the chashak. Right? The love, the longing, the clinging, right? For your daughter, right? In other words, it's like a man of war, right? If he's on that warrior tip and that over aggressive tip that, that a man gonna do might make right, he's gonna take it. He's, he's gonna take it, right? Ha Torah and Moshe's, you know, you say Moshe's, um, the Mishnah here is saying to them, you will not do what the other nations and other peoples have done, right? Yisrael, y'all are soldiers. Basically saying to Israel, y'all are soldiers, not degenerates, right? But what's interesting is the Hamor and the Shechem case because it says longing for your daughter, right? Give her him to wife. And then we look at the longing, which is the Hashak, Right? And then we look at the wife part, has a desire or has a chashak, has a longing to her. That's in favor of her, right? Upon her with love, right? That thou wouldest have her to thy wife. That you will extend, right, your rights as a citizen of Yisrael to this 
you could say, captive of an enemy people or an enemy nation. All right. So that is that point right there. The desire here is love. The quintessential verse to prove it is Deuteronomy 7, 7, where it says, he did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number. The context of it in the spirit of the language is Genesis 34 and 8. Before we get out of this right here, you know, because um, I want to touch on some of the main points. Let's touch on the fact that desire is not the same desire everywhere in the Bible. I remember hearing Sarnetta, I think somebody was talking about what does desire mean? And he's like, 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 yeah, like he, well, he didn't know, you know, but he was bringing out the sense of desire, you know, like a sexual desire, right? But it's clear that the context of the scripture, because then if this is to the Israelite man that has such a, quote, desire, then in Deuteronomy 7 and 7, we have to apply this to Yah. And then we have to apply this that, well, Solomon, he had the desire to build the temple in Jerusalem. Does this have anything to do with a perverse intent? Everywhere we see this particular chashak used, it's used with a higher intent. This means that if a man right, saw a beautiful captive, right, and if he did not have the chashak, right, this did not apply. The condition of this is that it had to apply. A man can just go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and do this. No. Everything, especially according to the Torah, according to the context, was regulated right, by the priests, the Kohanim, and by the Lewin, right? And it was also their responsibility that if one said, hey, you know, there's this, this captive woman that, you know, I, I want to make my wife. Properly going to Torah, one must discern whether there is chashak there. Now, was this done in every case or every situation? Well, judging from Israel, the ups and downs and folly and underground, how they turned their back on Yah, Yahuwah and on his Torah, well, we, we can safely say that there was no doubt abuses of this. But was this intent, an intent to justify the unjustifiable violation? No, because we have areas directly where an R-A-P-E is an R-A-P-E, and that is death. In fact, it says, it's as a man, you know what I mean? You know, lays in wait against his neighbor. You know what I mean? It basically, it connects R-A-P-E directly into Torah with murder. And the penalty for that was death, right? And in the context of a man doing this to a woman, it was death for the man and for the man only. So people are confusing things because the confusions in the translation Right? And the lack of a Holy Spirit, too. Let's point that out as well. Right? Or the Spirit of Truth. But if one is investigating, let's get the truth. This is the truth. There are five to six different words. Five to six different words for desire. The first one. Right? Remember, the word chashak is the word in Deuteronomy 21.11. Right? Also, it's the word there you know, within Genesis chapter 34 for longing. And also it's there, you know, with Solomon having desire to build, you know what I mean? The temple. So is this a, a ein ha tob, a good eye? Are we looking at it? If you look at it from a bad eye, you go on and you keep making believe whatever you want to make believe. But those who want to know the truth for themselves, let's go here. Now, here's the word desire. Genesis 3, 6, right? Chapter 3, verse 6. Bereshit. And when the woman, the Isha, saw the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. Now, you all know this is the, 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 in the, garden of Eden, the garden of Eden, the garden of delights. Now, this is subjective. I say subjective. The woman is seeing and, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, you know, because like one woman might be beautiful for me, right? And my brethren might say, well, she I, but he liked this woman over here because that is beauty in his eyes. And I say, she I, 
Right? Now, the woman here, the Isha, speaking of Chawa, or Eve, as she would later be known in the narrative, she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Whose eyes? Well, the woman saw, she saw, right, that it was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired. This is what we want to zoom in on. What kind of desire is this desire? Let's go to the Hebrew right here, here, here. Right? Vatera. Right? Watere. And seeing she. Watere. Haisha. Haisha. And the woman. Tere. 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 Watere. Haisha. And the woman saw Kito for good. Haits. Haits. The eights. The tree. Le maakal. Le maakal. Le maakal. Maakal to eat. Wiki, right? Tawa, who, right? Wait, 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 wait. Wiki, Tawa, who? Oh, we should have done it like this right here, right? But the, uh, let me just read through this right here once again. Wa tere haisha kitob haets le makal wikiya tawa who la ainaim we nechmad. Ha eitza le haskil wa tikach mi prioa wa tokal wa titain gam le isha ima le ishaha le ishaha her man right imah imaha imah with her. Why your cow and he ate? Let's go back here again. Let's look at the H25. So remember, chashak is desire. I'm saying that there's, a, there's about five different words. I think five to six different words for desire before we even get to that verse. Let's look at this desire. This desire is chamad. Chamad. The H25. The first time in the King James Version where we have the word desire is in the Gan Ba'edin scene in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Right? And it says, um, desired, right? Desired to make one wise. It was interesting that the word pleasant also is not the, always the same word pleasant. Tawa or tava. Tava is a desire, a longing, a lust, an appetite, covetousness. You see what it says in the bad sense? The bad sense. Elsewhere, this very same root word is going to be one of the five to six words for desire other than chashak, a thing desired, an object of desire. So this is even proven that even in the Deuteronomy 21, 11, the woman is not just being looked at as an object. This soldier, in a sense, you know, like sometimes they say, like a soldier, like, yeah, I'm just fulfilling my duty in the army, but he feel a way for even some of the victims, right? And he feel a way for her, right? He feels a way for her. Right? But it's not the same desire because here we have the Hamad. Hamad, let's go right there. The 25 30 word Hamad is the same word for Muhammad. Yes, it's, it's the same word for Muhammad. Like the, the Arabic and the Hebrew, Shia, the African Shemitic roots, many root words are Shia, Hamad. But now Hamad, desire, this particular desire, is spoken of when Yahweh Elohim spoke the ten words in Exodus chapter twenty, when he said, "Lo tachmod, lo tachmod, you are not to desire, right? You are not to covet, right? So that means even desire is regulatable. Desire is regulatable, right? What do you mean by desire is regulatable? It says you are not to desire, right? Your 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 neighbors, right? Your neighbors, anything that belongs to your neighbor is the overview. But just to bring out the Exodus detail, it says right here, it says, thou shall not desire, right? Rather, the translator says in Exodus 20, 17, Exodus 20, 17, thou shall not covet thy neighbor's house. Lo tachmod, tachmod, you're not to hamad. Lo tachmod, thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's bite, 
Thou shalt not covet lo tachmod thy neighbor's isha, thy neighbor's wife, woman, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything, nor anything, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. All right. So notice right here that when the woman now, from a subjective sense, in a higher way of interpreting this, this is like the soul. The woman would represent the psyche, the soul. Right, that aspect that's in man and woman. But here, the word hamad is translated as desire, but really look at the second word, it's kavet. Because this word elsewhere, even in the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, is translated as kavet. But it could be translated, since we're dealing with English, a translation, let's read it alter alternatively. Right? Alternately, right? Thou shalt not desire thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not desire, like lust after, covet thy neighbor's wife. Now, for those of us who study from the Hebrew perspective, Royal Order of the Ethiopian Hebrews, we know that the, the woman or the daughter, right? We have bat for daughter and we have bait for house. So there's an intimate and interesting connection between woman and and the significance of a house, right? And notice that in the 10 words, the Asereta de Barim in, Deut in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 18, verse 17, Slicha, Slicha, it says, um, Thou shall not covet, lo tachmod, right? To have a desire, yes, right? To have a delight, yes, but in the context, here of coveting, taking pleasure in, but taking pleasure in something that you don't have any right to take pleasure in. See, your neighbor has a right to covet, to desire his own house and to desire his own wife, but you do not have that right. But now notice what the woman, the Isha, Haisha did right here. It says right here that it, when she looked at the tree, the tree was chamad, right? The tree was desirable, was covetous. It was covetous to make lehaskil, sakal, wise, prudent, circumspect, understand. Why does he understand? I know all these people say, well, that's a good thing. Well, yes, it can be. But when it's connected with chamad, with covetousness, it's not a good wisdom check, right? It's not a good circumspection. It's not good intelligence. It's like when they say in modern days, they talk about bad intel, right? So the woman here in the Ganva Aden is acting from bad intel, right? And she took from a subjective intel. See, if we kept it, if they kept it objectively, they were not supposed to do it, no matter what the Nahai said. Right? So the woman now, this is her transgression. She went ahead and she did this. Now the man is disobedient because he was told not to do it. And that's what brought in the chet or the sin where it says from one man's disobedience, all were made sinners. It didn't say because people sin, they are sinners. No, it says because of one man, Adam, and it says he gave to her husband with her and he did eat. So the point here is that the first use in the English of desire is chamad, chamad, which is linguistically related even to mahamad, right? But here we have chamad, and in the ten words it says lo tachmod. You male are not to covet. Covet what? Not to covet anything. A man should covet that which is rightfully his. But you're not to covet that which belongs and that which is your neighbor's. Right? Check. That's the first one. Let's go to the second one here. Right? The second one here is Teshuka. Teshuka. So we just showed you right here. There are two, the first two places we have desire in the scripture. And this is in the same chapter. So we have the word desire in the same chapter, Genesis 3 and 6. And in Genesis 3 and 16, we have, we have the word, the same English word desire, but it's not the same Hebrew word. You see? We talk about trick knowledge, you know, one's tricking themselves right here. Because one would say from the first, you know, like it's when people reason and talk, oh, look, desire. And they would think it's the same desire. 
That's why it says to study. Rabbi Shaul, a.k.a. the apostle to Gentiles, apostle, our brother Paulos, Paul, he says, well, to Timothy, his disciple, study to show yourself approved. Here in Genesis 3.16 to the Isha, he said, now here is where Yahweh Elohim, right, is now pronouncing and announcing the consequences, right, to the woman of her transgression as to the man of his disobedience. The only one that was cursed, right, the only one, like, like person, so to speak, that was cursed was the Nahash, the Nahash, the serpent, right? And we're not literally talking about literal serpent in the allegorical sense, right? But we're speaking of, you know, a serpent type of, type of man. But anyway, be that as it may, it says, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, right? And wh why does he say I, right? Because you have eaten of the tree, right? The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of the science of Tob Vera, of Tob of good Wira, of good beneficial, right? As well as bad, harmful, right? You you experience the good, so a little bit of the good they experience in the Garden of Delight, the Ganba Aden. But wow, look at that, Aden, Aden, Aden mean delight to, right? But let's go on. So we have Tshuka here. It says, and thy conception in sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. This is the consequences, right, of doing opposite of what they was told not to do. Well, actually what Adam, let's point that out, Adam. Adam was told this singularly, right? So therefore, this is why to whom more is given, you heard that before, right? More is required, right? And thy desire, speaking to the woman, Yahweh Elohim here is speaking to the woman, right? And thy desire, but notice, this is not the Hamad, that can lead to the covetous, lo tachmo desire, is not the chashak, chashak, as we have with the soldier, right, after the battle, right, that, that love-based desire. But here it says, thy teshuka. What is teshuka? It says, thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee, or in the more Hebrew sense, overrule thee, right? See, Adam... Notice we're in the same chapter. Adam should have overruled her. Right? That's why it says, when he says, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Right? It wasn't that she told him, you better eat this. But he's hearing this conversation between the Nahash right, and his Isha, and he just stood down. Right? And then after she sees it subjectively from her point of view, Right? You remember the three brains, the, the mammalian brain, the more emotional, you know, the nurturing nature side. So even her intent in her own eyes, right, was good, right? When we just check this out right here. But he knew better, right? So now in the same chapter, the secondary desire, the second desire we have is Teshuka. What is Teshuka? Now notice, Teshuka here is brought out in the BDB as desire, longing, craving of a man for a woman or of a woman for a man or of a beast to devour, to eat. This is interesting. It's desire and longing and a craving. So it's saying to the woman that your, your desire, your longing, your craving, right? Since you're the woman, should be for the mind, right? Now, why would this be said unless something here in the narrative prior to it displayed the very opposite? Basically, Yahuwah Elohim is giving his advice, right? He's giving his advice right here. In other words, what he's saying to Hawa or the Isha is that you should have let him speak. You should let him deal with that right there. You know what I mean? But since you did eat, and he did eat, and y'all are one here, right? Therefore, this is the consequences to the man, and this is the consequences to the woman, right? And your desire, right, shall be to thy husband, 
right? And he will mashab. Let me bring out the word mashab, though we didn't touch on this before in this context, the H4910. Because people are like, oh, mashab. Mashab is an interesting word. It's somewhat related to mashab. <laughs> okay, there's mashab that means to rule, to have dominion, to reign, right? To exercise dominion. But there's also the secondary sense of mashab, which is like a parable. Literally, it's a parable, mashal, like the Mishle Shlomo, the parables of Solomon, right? To rule, to, to set the example, but also to be that one in charge, right? In other words, instead of you going ahead, right? In other words, the man didn't do what he was supposed to do. And therefore, you got into this trouble, and then he disobediently got into this trouble. But really, that was his call right there. So, to shuka is saying her longing should be to her husband. So it makes a question come up here. Was her longing to someone else? You know what I mean? Since Robeno Yeshua, the rabbi of rabbis, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, said to the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the, and the other um, um, false teachers, right? You know, he said that ye are of your father, the devil or satan because he was a murderer from the reishith the bereishith from genesis from the beginning right so who was the first one right that murdered so-called in the beginning according to the bible it was Cain. so many have asked whether cain you know whether cain is really adam's son you know that that has gone on and the scripture here in the mashal the uh, allegorical type ology is directly is 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 indirect indirectly it tells us right but directly it's silent on that but as we put it together like why would he say and your teshuka right shall be to your husband you know what i mean wasn't that already giving you see what it says right here the origin is from the h 7783 in the original sense of stretching out after Right, stretching out, spreading out, stretching out after should be to your husband, right? And the husband there, interestingly enough, right here is Ish, is Ish. So the Hosea prophecy is Ish, right? Shall be to thy man, to your man, because like she desired another man. Right? It brings out a very interesting reasoning, but we're not going to get into it. But anyone want to raise the reasoning again? Hopefully, y'all willing, we will. But here is from the H7783. Teshuka is from shuk. Shuk in the Hebrew. What is shuk? Right? It's abundant. Right? To give abundance. The sense is really like to overflow. To overflow. Like to run after. Your, your overflow. The cup can't spill unless it overflow, right? And it has a connection with like water, that flowing of water should be. It's almost like she got diverted after the Nahash, the serpent's conversation. And because Adam, in this incident, according to Moshe's first book, he kept absolutely quiet, right? He basically fail to respond and fail to speak he failed to act and then on top of that right and watching this back and forth with his isha remember he said she's bone of my bone flesh of my flesh she'd be called isha because she came from ish that was a very high statement to make but here in this incident he just disobeyed let's put it that way so here, Yah is basically saying, not so much, well, he'll be your husband, rule over, he's going to dominate you. No, no, it's, it's not really like that in the Hebrew context of it. It's basically telling her what I just told you and shared with you. That almost like saying to a daughter or, or you know, like, baby, you know, baby love, you're doing too much. He was doing too much. He was doing too much. It was basically that, that man, you know, it was, it was the ish. His responsibility on this. So we showed you so far, just quickly going through this, showed you Hamad, right, in Genesis uh, 3 and 6, and then 3.16, Teshuka. Here, 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 we have right here Teshuka again, 
right? Notice this right here, teshuk again, the, the same word, desire, stretching out after longing, like a man for a woman, that's a teshuka. A woman for a man is a teshuka, right? A beast to eat, you know, is a teshuka. You, you, if you have pets or animals, and when you give them the food and they're hungry to eat, there's that desire, right? That's how the man should be for the woman, the woman for the man. Let's check this here. Genesis 4 and 7, the second um, place where teshuka is used. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? This is saying to Kayin. After the the sacrificial incident where Abel's offering was accepted, but Cain's was not accepted, and his countenance fell, he's he's getting into bad vibes. You can say bad vibes. You know, his countenance fell and everything, and it's like that energy, that 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 despondency, that energy is attracting the ra'a. Right? He's getting the ayn ha ra'a. The evil eye. But Yah is seeking to kind of interdict right here, right? Where Yahweh Elohim is saying, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If you do as well, if you do that which is Yatab. Now, Yatab is the verb of Tob. And I say this also has a connection with the archaic name of Ethiopia, Tobia, Yatab, Yatab. But let's go down right here. It means to be good. If you do that which is good, that which is pleasing, that which is well, that which is glad, that which is happy, that which is joyful. If you do the right thing, right, if you make it well, you know what I mean, right? If, you, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Se'et, se'et, elevated, elevated. See, they say accepted in the English, but it's really, before that it says that, you know, his face you know, almost like his face fell in the Hebrew sense of like his face fell. You know, and it's almost like we would say today, like why your face on the ground? You know, why you seem so depressed, right? He says, will you not be elevated? Will you not raise up, right? You know, won't be so downpressed as we would say, right? Notice it goes on. And if thou doest not well, if you don't do yatab, yatab, to do the tov, do that which is good, good as a noun, yatab as a verb. Do good, right? Sin, right? Or chata'at, 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 right? Layeth at the door, sin, right? And sin, right, comes from the root sense in the Hebrew, chata. Chata is to sin or in a more direct sense to miss, to miss the way, right? So instead of saying just sin to get the idea, think about like you miss the way, you miss the mark, you go wrong, you incur guilt, you forfeit. Now the last one, purify from uncleanness, is due to the sacrificial type. In other words, if you do a chet, if you do a uk, you have to give a uk. In other words, you have to give an offering that is called the chata'at, right? In order for that to be forgiven, you know, you. To miss the right path, to miss, to incur guilt, guiltiness, rest upon their conscience. This is the whole sense right here, forfeit to lack. This is what's being told to Kayan, right? Just after the whole um, Abel's offering accepted, Cain's not, Cain's rejected. It says that the chata'at lieth at the door, and to thee shall his desire, right? And to the eye shall his desire be his desire, his teshuka. What? Who? Chata'at. Chata'a. Sin. So here even sin is not so much just as an act, but sin, this nature, this fallen, it, it becomes almost personified, right? Personified because it's like, it's like in, in computering, if you get a virus, this virus now, if you let this thing in, it's laying at your door. If you let it in, right, then it's going to corrupt your whole drive. And to thee shall his desire be, right? And thou shall rule. Notice what it says, rule, mashal. Isn't this interesting what was said to the woman about desire? Right? Considering that she was speaking so much in the Nahash, right? You could say a kind of a agent, right, to fall short, right? D your dominion. Right? Okay, so that's the shuka there. 
right? So let's go on right here, here, here. In Genesis 5, 6 and 5, desire is underlying this right here. But we shall go on. But wait, before we go on, let's bring out the ra'a, ra'a, right? Ra'a is the bad, the evil. In religious terms, they say evil. But sometimes you don't get the, the, the real world context. That which is disagreeable, that which is malignant is ra'a. That which is unpleasant, ra-ra, right? The ra-ra. Right? That which gives pain, unhappiness, misery, displeasing. And it could be ra'a, like that which is ra-ra land, ra-ra water. Right? Bad. Right? That which is bad of value. Right? That which is worse. That which is sad. That which is unhappy. In religious terms, they would say evil. But in applicable senses, that which is hurtful. That which is unkind. Like somebody has a ra-ra attitude. Like their vicious attitude. Right? Connected with wicked. Right? In general, of persons, of thoughts, of deeds, of action. So, this is all that they did not know, right? In that first state, according to the narrative in the scripture, before they stretch forth their hand to eat of the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge, the science of Tovera, right? Of good, positive, beneficial, pleasing, and displeasing, hurtful, harmful. That is what was introduced. Right into the equation. Exodus 10, 11. Not so. Now y'all that are men and serve Yahuwah. For y'all did desire. For that. Excuse me. For that y'all did desire. Here's Paro. Right. Here's where they're being. They, they want to go forward to worship Yahuwah. Right. Eloheinu. And here we have. Is this, is this Paro? This is Pharaoh saying right here. Right, and he said, right, right here, uh-huh, right, let the little ones go with you, right, and he, uh, yeah, 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 Moses and Paro, oh, right, in that, you know, in that back and forth, so to speak, right, he says, not so, Paro, oh, the great house, Sutanet, Sutanbet, Bitti, right, go now, y'all that are men, and serve Yahuwah. For that y'all did desire, your, your desire to go serve Yahuwah. So, um, Paro, the Sutanet, Sutanbet of Tawi, of Mitzrayim, of, of the two lands, he, he think he's getting slick. He's saying that all the men should go to, to worship. <laughs> we want to get our women and children in our possession, right? You men, all y'all that are men, right? For that y'all did desire. And they were driven out from Paro, the great house, the per a a right, presence. But let's look at the word desire. Now here we have the H1245. This is Bakash. Bakash. What is Bakash? We have Bakash. Bakash here. Bakash, like we say in Hebrew, like to say please or in some senses, Vevavakasha, 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 Vevavakasha. Here we have Bakash, to seek, to require, to exact, right, to desire, to request. It has a sense of seeking. This is what you're seeking. This is what you're desiring by, by way of a demand. This is what you're requiring. This is what you are asking, right? Vevavakasha, Bakash. But notice Bakash, notice the strongs bring out the clear sense. It's to search, to seek, to search out by any method. But specifically in the Hebrew, it's in worship or prayer. That's what they're asking when it says to serve Yahuwah, right? Is to serve him, right? As in the Tawi in ancient Mitzrayim, they have 42 different denominations. They're serving their natures. But now we want to serve the nature of natures, Yahuwah Eloheinu, right? So he's saying, well, that is what you bakash. That's what you seek to worship, to pray, to strive after in that sense, you know, to inquire of the Lord, so to speak. So here we have Bakash. So, so far we have Hamad, we have Teshuka, and we have Bakash. These are all desires. If you read in the English, you might see all these as, as the same one. Exodus 34, 24. For I will cast out the nations before thee and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land, when thou shalt go up to appear, lifne Yahuwah Eloheka, before HaKadosh Baruch Hu Baruch Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be He, blessed be the name, thy Elohim, thrice, three times in the Shana, three times in the year. Let's look at the word desire here. Here we have the H2530. We have Hamad, 
Remember, Hamad was the first desire in Genesis 3 and 6, the Hamad that's connected with Lo Tachmod, the ten words, the commandment, Ha Mitzvah, right? It's all one command, ten articles, ten words. One of them is Lo Tachmod, thou shall not desire, covet thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife, or anything that is thy neighbor's. So Yahuwah is saying that when the Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel, keep the direction instructions and go up to appear right in the proper times and season what does yahuwah says he will cast out the other nationalities the nations before thee and enlarge our borders and no man neither shall any man hamad covet covet our land when thou shall go up to appear Lifne Yahuwah Loheka, when you go forth to appear before Jehovah thy Elohim three times in the year. So here is Hamad. You see how Hamad here for desires used and how that's connected with the subjective sense, right? In the allegorical of the soul, according to the narrative of the woman, right? Within the Genesis narrative. Let's go on right here. Right, so right here in Deuteronomy 5 21, this is the repetition, the Mishnah Torah in, in the Gospel of Moses. Neither shall thou desire, that's the Hamad, right, thy neighbors. Notice in Genesis, not Genesis, Slicha, in Exodus chapter 20, was that verse uh, 17? Chavarim, yeah, verse 17, KJV reads the very same Hebrew word as thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. In Deuteronomy 5.21, it is translated as thou shalt not desire the same Hamad, lo tachmod, right, thy neighbor's wife. Neither shall thou covet, lo tachmod, right. So notice, here they use the Ava, which is another, another desire. That will make how many do we have here so far? Let's count them. Hamad one. Teshuka two. Bagash three. Right? And we're going to have the Ava. Ava. Right? The Ava coming forward. Let's move forward right here. Thou shall not desire. That's the Hamad. Right? The Hamad Kavet. When it says in Deuteronomy 7.25, the graven image of their Elohim, their natures or whatever, right, shall your burn with fire. Thou shall not desire, Haman, want to covet the silver, the kesef or the zahab, the gold that is on them to desire that gold. You see some gold, you're like, yo, yo, I want that for myself. That's the Haman. Nor take it to thee. Lest if you do that, you're going to be sneered therein. If you desire their gold and their silver, you covet their gold and their silver, that gold, that silver and gold becomes a sneer for you, for it is to'eba. To'eba is disgusting. To'eba in the Hebrew. It is an abomination. To'eba to Yahuwah Eloheka, to Jehovah your Elohim. Let's go forward. So, so far it's bringing out even more context to the Hamad sense, right? But here in Deuteronomy 14.25, we don't want to get to like the five to six other desires, right? So what does love have to do with it? Chashak. It is love-based. Deuteronomy 14, 26. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. Interesting word right here. That's the same ava. As we're going to see it, King James Version is going to bring it out in the desire sense. So that's also one of the five to six different words in Hebrew for desire. Here, Deuteronomy 14, 26, and thou shalt bestow that money, or more correctly, that kesef. Kesef is the silver, right? Silver currency. For whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, whatever it desires, for oxen, for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. Sha'al. Sha'el, sha'al. Shael, so desire here is ask. Did you know that in, in the Exodus narrative, King James Version, it says for the Israelite men and women to borrow of their neighbors, like silver or gold, jewelry, you know. No, it doesn't say borrow in the Hebrew, it says Sha'al. 
Sha'al properly is to ask, right? Ask, right? To ask, to inquire, to ask. But they translate it as to borrow. Because people say, well, they borrow. When are they going to pay back? Well, Sha'al here is translated for whatever thy soul, thy psyche, which is feminine, nefesh, right? Nefesh is the soul, the life. It brings down the Hebrew sense is the breathing creature in man. The breathing creature in man, right? But notice that the nefesh, right, which is the soul, is the feminine in male and female, right? Properly a breathing creature. That is the animal or the abstractly the animal vitality. So whatever our soul right, might desire, you know, might ask for. You know what I'm saying? Some of you want certain food because your soul desires that. But in the Hebrew sense, your soul is asking for that. Right? And thou shalt eat thee lifne Yahweh Loheka before he who be who he be thy Elohim. And thou shalt rejoice, thou, the I, male, and thine household. Right? So there we have the Sha'al. Right? Sha'al. How many desires do we have here so far? The Hamad, Kavet, is often the best way to bring that out. We have the Hamad, right? We have the Teshuka, the stretching out, the longing, overflowing for, the stretching out for, right? We have the Bakash, right? The seeking, seeking like in prayer, in worship, the Bakash sense, right? We have the Sha'al. Right, the Sha'al sense, and here in Deuteronomy 18 and 6, and if a Levite come from any of thy gates out of Kol Yisrael, all of Israel, where he sojourneth, and come with all the desire of his mind to the Makom, the spot, the place that Yahuwah shall choose. What desire is this here? This is the H185. Remember we said about the Ava? We kind of saw Ava elsewhere. One place it was as Kovet, um, another place also, but here is directly translated in the KJV in Deuteronomy 18 and 6. The Ava, or more properly pointed as Awa, Awa, Awa. There's a place in the Exodus narrative when the people, they longed for debtors. They wanted to eat flesh, right? They wanted to eat debtors, like flesh. Right. And Yahuwah gave them like the quail and all that. And they ate so much until the Torah says that it was like coming out of their nose and people were getting sick, you know, from eating dead as they wanted to eat flesh. And the place that that spot is called the Kivrot Hata'ava, the Kivrot Hata'ava. What is the Kivrot Hata'ava? Well, the Kivrot, Kivrot mean graves, Kivrot. From the Kabar, like to bury. Kivrot or Kivrot in modern Hebrew means grave. And Ta'ava, Ta'awa, Ta'awa is desire. So it became known as the graves of lust, the graves of the bad kind of desire. Not that Awa is always evil, but it's the context here. You can see BDB has desire, lust, the will, the will. So this is also a will. Not necessarily evil, right? But in the context of the scripts, usually you have to be careful with this kind of a desire, right? The awa. And the example we gave is the kivrot hata'awa or hata'ava, the graves of lust, where the people desired debtors. They wanted to eat flesh, right? And they tempted Yahweh Loheinu, and he gave them their desire and they just were so greedy at it that they started to come out their nose and it was hell you know what i mean and many people died it was probably just filthy you know what i mean and they were buried there and that spot was called the graves of lust right the graveyards of lust the kivrot hata'ava right so this is this longing this desire this lusting after, usually it's a lusting after of pleasure, usually the lowest, the base, it's like the lower self, right? Like I said, it's not always, right, as we have in this case right here. He come with all of the will, the desire, but it's more of a natural sign, the desire of his what? The desire of his nefesh. Notice what it says right there. The King James Version translates his mind, but nefesh is the soul. 
Nefesh is the soul, as we have right here, the noun feminine, or in the Hebrew sense, the breathing creature in man. It's the animal vitality. It's like the core. It's like the core part of our manifest, you know, manifestation, the, the soul, the psyche. Yes, it's feminine. And yes, when we say this is the true feminine side, it's not even the feminine side. It's the, it's the living creature aspect in us, whether you're male or female, Hebraically, it's feminine. So here, when it says the desire of his mind, right, the will, right, what he longed after of his mind. In other words, like a Levite may want to serve because he's a Levite. His father's before him. They did it. They talked about it. It's like many men want to go in the army because some of our ancestors, you know, father or grandfather or brothers or others were in the army. And the way they talked about it, so forth and so on, we want to also, you know, like do it as well. So it doesn't always mean it's a bad thing, right? But it's not coming from the necessarily the highest place, but it's coming from the basic the basic place, or the desire of his mind to the place which Yahuwah shall choose. And we're going to just take this up to where we were, right? To Deuteronomy 21, 11, to see how many places before we get here that we have this word or we have desire. And are they the same Hebrew word? So far, we've proven they're not. 18 and 16, about to sum this up. According to all that, that thou desirest, Sha'al, the Sha'al again, Sha'al Sha'el, right? To ask, Sha'al, to consult, to inquire. It can mean to beg in a sense, right? To be given on request, right? Here, the basic sense is to inquire, like to ask in a sense of to inquire. The implication of this is to request. By extension, the Sha'al can also mean demand. To ask is the basic sense. This is the basic sense of this word. But notice here in Deuteronomy 18 and 16, it says, according to all that thou, the singular here sense, the singular collective, desirous of Yahuwah Eloheka, of he who be who he be, thy Elohim, thy almighty power in Choreb, right? In the solitude, in the day of the assembly saying, make me not hear again the voice of Yahuwah Elohai, this is what the people said. Remember, we pointed to this in Exodus. Compare this right here with Exodus. Exodus chapter, what is this? Exodus chapter 20 at verse, uh, at verse um, chapter 20, I think it's verse 18. I think it's 2018. No, 2019. In 2019. And they said to Moshe, speak thou with us and we will hear but let not elohim speak with us lest we die so moshe here in deuteronomy is giving the new generation the children of the forefathers who who um forfeited the entry and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years he's giving them his testimony here in the gospel of moses in deuteronomy he's saying according to all that thou desire speaking to all israel as one man of yahuwah eloheka in Choreb in the solitude, Choreb, in the day of the assembly saying, make me not hear again the voice of Yahuwah Elohai, Elohai, Jehovah my God, right? It's interesting right here because Moses, it's the same incident, but one is a more objective view of it. And Moses here is giving his, you could say his personal recollection, right? Instructing a new generation. Let me not hear again the voice of Yahuwah Elohai, neither let me see this great fire, this ash, ash, fire, Issai, anymore that I die not. So compare this, Deuteronomy 18.16, with Exodus 20.19. What a year, what a year. Here, 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 and look, we now reach Deuteronomy 21.11 and the Hashak. And notice that hashak in the Kaal, the basic sense means to love, to be attached to. It's love in the sense of attachment. Because we have ahav, right? Ahav. That, that's love too. It's not always in the sense of attachment. 
but it's love all the same. This is love to be attached to. And this is this is the qualification. In other words, this is the qualification of any soldier of Yasharala, my that may have seen among the captives uh Eshet Yefat Tawar. The key is that he would have to have a Hashak. He cannot have a Hamad, right? He cannot have just a Teshuka. He cannot have a Bakash, right? He cannot have a Sha'al to ask for it. No, no, because not according to Torah, right? He cannot have a Ava, a Awa, right? He has to have a Hashak, right, to her. That thou wouldest have her to thy wife, because the hashak is connected with wifing her up, right? In other words, in that sense, bringing her into the commonwealth of Yasharala. A little point I want to make, just in closing, where it says, "And thou shalt bring her home to thy house." It implies right here, according to the Hebrew sense, a People say, when we say a voluntary sense, right, if she refused to go with him, right, then she just becomes a bondwoman among Yasharal or what, whatnot, or whatever the Israelites chose to do in that sense. We're not going into that. And when it says she shall shave her head and peer her nails, I've heard people say, well, would the woman do this or would the man do this? It's clear that she should even in a true sense of Torah interpretation, she must do this. She should do this. She should not be forced to do this. If she refused to do this, it doesn't say that her head shall be shaved and her nails peered because the Hebrew sense is this is what she shall do. It almost implies that there is some sense of a mutual sense. People say, well, what about her mother, father? Listen, War is war, and other nations did not even at that time have such grace for the soldiers. The soldiers might made right, so a man can do whatever he wanted to do. Not so with Yisrael. The Israelites were to be soldiers and not degenerates. As it says, and she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off of her. She will do that. Not that you, you, you just rip her clothing off. And shall remain in thy house. It doesn't mean you lock her up or put chains on her. And she will bewail her father and her mother. And the bewail here, right? Baka, baka, to weep, to cry, to shed tears. You know, that old life is over. And there's a possibility of a new life, right? Among Yisrael, of being a wife. If this is what, people say, does she have a choice? According to the true interpretation, the intent of Torah, yes. Did this mean that whenever this was practiced, this is how the Israelites did it? Based on their inconformity to Yah's will, I would say nay. Right? So what Yah intended was one thing. I mean, let's just scroll back to the Gan Ba'edin. He said to Adam, right? He warned Adam not to eat of this. You can eat of all these trees, but not this tree. Not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day that you eat of it, you will be dying to death. You know, but what did he do? You see what I'm saying? So there's still that choice factor. That's the free will. Some say, well, how can you have free will? And somebody says, you should not. No, he says, he says um, thou should not eat of it, but in the day that you eat of it, it basically says you can eat of it. Well, don't eat of it, but if you eat of it, these are the consequences. That definitely is a is a is is some level of free will and choice. And it's clear that Yahuwah commanded them to do many things that they did not do. Right? So this basically says a full month and after that thou shall go into her and be her husband and she shall be thy wife. One thing if anybody knows about ancient wars and even wars today. If a man is a R-A-P-ist, you know, a R-A-P-ist, I'm not saying a rapper, right? But if he's a R-A-P-ist, you know what I mean? Then he's not going to have any sort of restraint, right? Very, very little, because this is why it is such a crime. Now, for the Israelites to be instructed thousands of years ago not to do this, 
what one needs to show me, and whether it is Tawi or it is Mesopotamia or any of these other nations, where they strictly command their soldiers on something similar. Because what we know from history, you know, and what was done to even the Israelite woman, you know, by other nations and the black woman, even here in these Americas with these antichrist hypocrites, you know, saying that that was not done. But anyway, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers right here, 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 just to sum this up right here. What is this called? The great, right? Well, the alleged here we have the alleged R.A.P.E. debate. Because there shouldn't be no debate over this if one clearly understands the context and the linguistic science here. You know, maybe you can go to, we can go to another verse, you know, and one can scrutinize or strain the eyes and see, right? But yes, there is R-A-P-E in the scripture, but this here in Deuteronomy chapter 21, right, from verse 10 forward, right, 21 and 10, and especially in 21 and 11, is not about R-A-P-E, right? It's not about that. So anyway, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, shalom. You know, Yeshua shalom, right? And give thanks to the others that have watched this. I know it was a little bit long right here, 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 but just wanted to get some of these basics, you know? They were like, how many words, once again? Other words for for desire. Let's just count that on the outro here. There was the Hamad, one. There was the Teshuka, two. There was the Bagash, three. There was the Sha'al, right? The Sha'al, four. There was the Ava or Awa, right? Five. And then we get to the Hashak. And we find that in the translation of Deuteronomy 7 and 7, Yahuwah, in a sense, that same word is used by the Almighty in reference to Israel. And we know in many instances, he regards Yisrael as a collective, almost likened to a wife, right? And therefore, this makes perfect connection with the conditions that were upon the soldiers of Israel. If they did not meet those conditions, right, then properly, in a proper keeping of Torah, it was not to be done. Was it done opposite of that? Well, knowing what's in people and what's in men and people, I cannot say it was not, but that was not the intent. Because real Israelite men, real mind them, don't R-A-P-E, don't write. Yes. Shalom Habarim, Shalom, Yeshua Shalom.